A short while ago, I created the custom alien race that I called the Scrav Aeoc. Now, a lot of you seem to enjoy that video, so I thought I'd have another go at kitbashing a custom Xenos race. Now, I've also been asked to take on some space lizards in the same way that I tackled the space Skaven. So, why not kill two Thunderhawks with one missile and kitbash a custom Xenos race using lizard men as the basis? First, let's hear from the sponsors of this video. War Thunder, the most comprehensive vehicle combat game of its kind. With over 2,000 tanks, planes, helicopters, and ships at your disposal, get ready to dive into dynamic, combined arms, PvP battles. Every vehicle in War Thunder has been meticulously detailed and modeled right down to their individual components, but the realism doesn't end there. With a collection of vehicles spanning over 100 years of development from the 1920s to the present day, it means you can take command of one of my favorite tanks, the British Centurion, arguably one of the world's first MBTs. War Thunder also features authentic vehicle damage with the game's dynamic damage model, ensuring that no two battles are ever the same. On top of this, you can also customize your vehicles with hundreds of camouflages, historical markings, and 3D decorators like bushes and equipment. And the best part? you can play for free. Experience stunning 4K graphics, authentic sound effects, and beautiful music on PC, Xbox Series X and S, PlayStation 5, as well as the previous console generation. Plus, with no need for extra pilot hardware, you're free to conquer the skies using just your mouse and keyboard, thanks to the game's intuitive mouse aim mode. Join War Thunder now and immerse yourself in the battle. Use my link below and receive awesome bonuses, such as boosters and premium vehicles. The new Saurus kit seemed like the best place to start here. The sculpts are practically brand new and they're some fantastic looking miniatures. So armed with one of these kits, all the parts required to build a Saurus were clipped away and cleaned up. The only exceptions being the weapons and shields, as these will be swapped out for something a little more futuristic. The race that I'm designing here are members of the Corathian Dominion. While they appear to be lizard men, they are in fact genetic hybrids. Each individual within the Dominion has been genetically modified to serve a particular role in their society, with the lizard-like traits being co-opted for military uses. After millennia of modifications, it's unknown what the race originally looked like. Imperial scholars have discovered traces of human DNA within their genomes, but whether or not this is from their original form, or if it's been added to the genetic melting pot later, is still unknown. With this background in mind, anything overtly Seraphon in its design needed to be removed. This included the armor on the thighs and any trinkets attached to them. The pattern on the armor was carefully trimmed and shaved back until I was left with a flat surface and the small ornament was clipped away too. From here, the torso could be assembled. Now for the head, I did play around with giving the model a helmet, but instead, it proved tricky to find something that A, was the right shape and size, and B, actually looked right. So ultimately, the regular Saurus head was used. For the arms, however, there would need to be some deviations from the original kit. Nothing screams Seraphon than the Aztec-style weaponry of the original Saurus, so the forearms would be replaced with some bionic hands. The Sicarian Rust Stalker's cord claws would be the donor of the new bionics. After a quick comparison, the Saurus's outstretched right arm was clipped back to just below the elbow. The arm was then shaved and trimmed back to create a smoother, more organic looking edge. The Sicarian arm was clipped at roughly a similar point, using the pre-existing seam as a guide for the cut. After this cut was flattened out, the cord claw was glued to it. From here, the forearm was glued to the upper arm, and finally, everything was attached to the torso, completing the right arm. The same process was then repeated with the left arm, albeit using one of the Sicarian Infiltrator's left arms instead. By swapping out these arms for bionics, it not only gave the model the ability to be armed with more futuristic looking weapons, but it also helped to further separate the model from its original source. The Sicarian arms can either be equipped with a flechette blaster or stub carbine, but they were both a little too mechanical. While not an official member of the Empire, I wanted something that hinted at the Dominion's close trading ties with the Tau, and so a Tau Breacher's pulse shotgun was sourced. 
The front end of this was cut away, again using the seam as a guide. After this, the barrel of the stub carbine was clipped away. Both halves of the weapon were then trimmed and adjusted until the two could be glued together. The result was something that appeared to have Tau influences, but still had a degree of crudeness to it. Finally, everything was attached to the arm, and the arm was attached to the torso, completing the model's basic frame. But before anything else was added to the model, the Space Lizard was superglued to a temporary base. The base used was smaller to help retain access to certain parts of the model, but by attaching it to a base, it would make the Mini easy to hold during the subsequent steps. The weapon and hand swaps were just the start of things though. This Corathian warrior needed some equipment, and if you are a regular watcher of my videos, you'll know that means a lot of pouches and equipment. But I couldn't just glue pouches directly to the lizard's skin. Instead, a harness of sorts would be created with some putty, specifically a roughly 50-50 mixture of green stuff and milliput superfine. By combining these two putties, the resultant mixture had the best of both worlds. The milliput gave the mix a degree of firmness that would allow the formation of sharper edges, while the green stuff would help to smooth things out and avoid that chalky nature that milliput can get. The harness was created by rolling out some thin sausages before slightly pressing them flat by rolling the handle of a paintbrush perpendicular to the strip. By keeping the pressure consistent, the resulting strap would be the same width along the entire length. Also, make sure to use some Vaseline or water during this step. It will help to prevent the putty from sticking to your hands, tools, and surfaces. With this strap created, it was carefully wrapped around the torso before cutting away any excess. Finally, the strap was gently pressed across the lizard's chest using some rubber-tipped sculpting tools. This process was repeated, joining up the straps together until a rough harness shape was created. To finish this off though, a few small squares of flattened putty were applied to the joints to help hide any rough edges. After this, the putty was allowed to cure fully overnight before proceeding. To give these straps a purpose, various pouches and equipment were superglued to them. These were sourced from a range of different kits, including Votan, Palanite and Forces, and Tau. Essentially anything that looked a little techy, but not overly stylized. The final modification saw me adding a shoulder-mounted sensor array. The arm for this was formed from the bionic arm found in the Iron Head Prospector's kit. The rounded attachment was first clipped in half to create a flat mounting point. In addition to this, the rounded piece at the end of the arm was also clipped away and smoothed out. With the arm prepped, it was superglued to one of the straps on the right shoulder, with the arm following the direction of the rest of the model. The actual sensor array was sourced from the Skatari kit and required no modification before it was glued. And with that, the model was ready to be painted. To begin, the whole miniature was primed with a grey primer. As I intended the skin colour of this creature to be paler, having a slightly lighter starting point would help massively. The primer used here was applied via an airbrush, but regular rattle cans will work too. The basis of this skin colour was taken from the Cult of Paints Albino Skin Painting Guide. I'll be covering how I approach things in full, but I would highly recommend checking out that video too. So, to begin, the whole model was coated with Wraithbone. Now this and the previous step could have been combined into one by using the Wraithbone Spray Primer, but I don't have any, so I had to rely on airbrushing the regular paint over a primer. This off-white would create the perfect starting point for pale skin. In order for the skin to have some definition to it, a mixture of Majors Purple and Dreadful Visage contrast paints were mixed together in my airbrush with some thinner. The greyish lavender colour of Dreadful Visage helped to desaturate the Majors Purple a little and tone down its intensity. This mixture was then lightly sprayed across the scales, head crest and feet. Here the mixture subtly adjusted the tone of the skin adding a little pinkish purple and emulating the appearance of albino lizards. This exact same mixture was then replied with a brush directly into the recesses of the scales. Here, the result was more intense, resulting in more definition being added to the scales, whilst continuing with the coloration started in the previous step. For the spines that ran the length of the back, as well as the claws on the feet, some of Toothin Coat's rodent grey was used. 
This lighter, warmish grey allowed these areas to stand out against the pale skin, while still being able to look like a natural part of the skin. However, to help blend those rodent grey areas into the surrounding pinks and purples, some more dreadful visage was glazed across them. The glaze had the effect of adding a very slight purplish hue, further tying it into its surrounding surfaces. For some of the deeper recesses in between the scales and around the face, some major purple was applied. By not desaturating the mix with Dreadful Visage, it helps these particular areas to stand apart a little with their more intense purpley pink coloration. Now, before I continued, I just want to make sure that I hadn't missed any areas of the skin with my previous steps, and the easiest way to do this was to jump ahead and base coat any of the non-skin areas. This covered everywhere that not already been tackled, and these were all given a couple of layers of Death Reaper. This extremely dark grey would really stand out against the pale skin, helping it to appear even more striking as a result. The dark, uniform coloration of the equipment would also give the model that more futuristic, techy look as well. After all the non-skin areas had been painted and a few missed areas had been touched up, work could begin on the highlights. To highlight the skin, a mixture of Major's Purple, Dreadful Visage and Wraithbone was mixed up. The resulting off-white paint with just a hint of purple and pink was then used to edge highlight the scales and other details across the skin. By not going straight for a pure wraith bone or even a white here, the result was a more subtle yet still noticeable highlight. In a similar fashion, some rodent grey was lightened by mixing some wraith bone into it. The resulting mixture was then highlighted across the spines, teeth and claws. To highlight the straps, pouches and equipment, I began with some cold corpse blue to pick out all of the edges. By giving these details a subtle blue tone, it further helped to separate them from the skin color. Following this, a few of the upper edges were picked out with some of the lighter wolf gray, before adding just a few small spots of gravestone blue to just the corners and sharper points of the edges. While most of the details had already been painted, there were still a small number of metallic details. These included the bionic claws, the clips and the buckles on the pouches, as well as a few smaller details dotted about. These were all given an initial coat of the dark silver of dwarven iron, before then being highlighted with a much brighter mithril blade. From here, there were just a few small details left to tackle. The first involved painting the lenses in the sensor, which would act as a starting point for some of the glowing effects. In addition to this, some chunky angular lines of wraithbone were painted onto the flat panels on the legs, creating the appearance of alien markings or text. Both of these areas were then given a coat of magma droth flame. Over the lenses, it helped to create a bright orange glowing effect, and over the armor, it helped to give that text a bright, contrasting orange to break up the otherwise flat black surfaces. With the model itself completed, work could begin on the actual base. For this step, a Necromunda base was used and some black primer was applied to it to help with the darker finish that this base would ultimately have. To paint the base, I opted to do some dry brushing due to the extra surface texture it can create. Some Coal Corpse Blue was laid out onto my texture palette before dipping my ever so slightly dampened Artis Opus dry brush into it. Here the paint was worked through the bristles before a circular and stippling motion was used to apply the paint to the base. My focus was limited to just one side of the base and as I moved through the lighter paints of Wolf Grey and then Gravestone Blue, the area coverage was slightly reduced each time. This resulted in a gradient of light to dark forming across the base. In order to create the impression of a constructed surface being reclaimed by nature, some of AK Interactive's Dark Earth texture paint was applied thickly to just the darker side of the base. As it moved across the base, the application became purposefully patchy to help feed into that transition. After giving the texture paste plenty of time to dry, its sandy texture was picked out with a couple of dry brushes. Gung Ho Green was applied first, followed by Green Beret. The earthy green tones of both of these helped to give the soil a mossy appearance. From here, there were just a few final details left to add. The rim was first cleaned up with some Doom Death Black, before giving both the base and the mini a coat of matte varnish to help seal everything in. 
The miniature was then removed from its temporary base, the contact points were cleaned up of their paint, and the two were glued together. Removing the paint here just ensures that the two surfaces adhere properly. And with that, I was left with this. And here we have the finished member of the Corathian Dominion's military forces. My biggest challenge in building this miniature was creating something that sat apart from the Seraphon. I've seen a number of conversions that have recreated Space Seraphon by referencing their creation by the old ones. These tend to retain most of their Seraphon design or burrow heavily from Necron components. With this, I didn't want the result to just look like a sci-fi rendition of an Age of Sigma race, and instead be something of its own. And while I certainly could have taken things further, I do think that I've managed to achieve this. The more human-looking equipment plays a part in this and helps to give the model the appearance of being a humanoid lizard, rather than something that is specifically related to the Seraphon. Like with my previous Scrav Aok build, it was pretty fun building something new here. Not having to rely on any established lore and instead building my own background is not only liberating, but also offers its own set of challenges. But still, I definitely recommend giving a custom Xenos race a go yourself. Now, whether or not you build one of these Carathians yourself, hopefully this guide will have something that you found useful for your own projects. But if you would like to recreate this model, you can find all the parts and paints I used to build this linked in the description below. If you enjoyed this custom faction build and have any suggestions for others I could take on in the future, please do let me know in the comments. But before I go, I just want to say a big thank you to War Thunder for sponsoring this video. Remember to check out the game with my link below to receive some awesome bonuses such as boosters and premium vehicles. See you on the battlefield. My biggest thanks goes to my Patreon supporters and channel members who help to keep this channel going, especially my pouch of dead animal bits and above supporters who are Jonathan Hart, Matt Savitsky, Morgan, Ryan Little, Swedsman, Tim, Daniel Dowling, Immaterial Creations, Johans, Jonathan Sunsteed, Mr. Grimm, Pale Juice, and the Googles. And my Sergeant Level members who are Mr. Jared Hess95, Nosium Paints, Mog Taylor, and Philip Poya. If you are interested in supporting me, you can hit the join button below or find a link to my Patreon in the description. Supporters get a whole host of benefits, including ad-free access to my videos, sneak peeks, a private Discord channel, and exclusive merchandise. Speaking of merchandise, I also have a few t-shirts and mugs up for sale featuring designs drawn by me. You can check those out by following the links below or by going over to PeteTheWarGamer.com. So, until next time, thanks for watching, and goodbye.